Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm so excited to have one of my dearest friends, Dr. John Norin, on today's show. Hi, John. Hey, guys. Great to see you. Amy, Dr. Amy, thank you so much for having me. If you call me Dr. Amy, no show for you. <laughs> I love, <laughs> no show for you. I love hanging out with you. I wish we lived closer. And I just want to tell our audience a little bit about you, and sh- certainly I want you to share with us, too, about yourself. But John is um, with HRC Fertility, and you have an office in Pasadena now, right? I do, Pasadena, and then a bedroom community in Rancho Cucamonga. Nice. Why do they call it a bedroom community? Because it's kind of hopping there in Rancho Cucamonga. It is. There's a lot going on. We're right near the Ontario Airport, an international airport. Yeah, I love that airport. I went to UC Riverside, so that was one of the closest airports, and when they remodeled it, it was fabulous for everybody. So you do everything related to fertility, just like me. You're board certified in OBGYN and reproductive endocrinology, and you went to UC Berkeley with a medical degree from the Royal College of Surgeons, and you finished your residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and your fellowship at the NIH. Not too shabby. Very, very impressive. And not only that, you were a lieutenant commander, commander, that's very funny for me to say, in the U.S. Public Health Service, and you've had the privilege of providing care to military families. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And we're going to get to the meat of this, which is challenging IVF cases and what can we do? So John, did I leave anything out that you want to share with our audience about yourself? No, you, you hit all the main points. I'm a, I'm a real advocate for all people struggling with fertility, whether you have male parts, female parts, whether you're uh, single in a same-sex relationship or you know, just sort of walking the walk of fertility. So um, it's so nice to be chatting about it. Thank you. You're welcome. So you're a baby maker (laughs) for anyone who wants a baby. Okay. So first IVF challenge I want to talk through. So you're doing an egg retrieval or you have a patient who presents this case to you from like, like as a second opinion consult and there are no eggs at the time of egg retrieval. What do you think about? What is the process that you go through? Right. So no eggs at retrieval. Um, sometimes as a reproductive specialist, we're, we have a little bit of an idea if they're going to be a low responder, medium responder, high responder. Of course we do, because we're monitoring the follicles. We're seeing how they're growing and developing. So if I have a woman who has, let's say, 15 follicles and I get no eggs, that's totally different than a woman who has, let's say, one or two follicles and gets no eggs. But let's go with the 15, because that's super rare. And um, so what would I do? Number one, I would be bummed. I would be disappointed. Um, Let's just call a spade a spade. Um, Because I'm so particular at retrieval. Like when I'm doing a retrieval, I'm doing little techniques to try to release the egg from that follicle. So one, you might have seen me spin my fingers. Um, We're we're doing different techniques to to help with uh, egg yield, number one. Um, Number two is in the PACU, in the post-anesthesia care unit, I would check an HCG, a blood level, an HCG in a progesterone level. Because I want to see, was there an issue with the trigger? Like, by chance, did did I use an HCG trigger, like a full 10,000 units? Or did I use a Lupron trigger, which is a GNRH. It's, you know, we need more tea or coffee to talk about that. But I'd want to know the type of trigger and then um, and check a level to see, did she take her medications correctly and, um, and that sort of thing. So, so those are sort of like two starting points right there. So um, could be a medication issue. What else? Yeah, could be a medication issue. Now, um, other things, it's a really rare situation. And by the way, the group at the NIH and other groups around the U.S. have published on this, where it's called an empty follicle syndrome. And it's super, super rare. Believe it or not, in research studies, 
you know, well done studies, they've looked at it and two thirds of the time, there's a medication issue. So about a third of the time though, people have rare situations where the egg just doesn't release from the follicle. So what, what are reasons for that? Uh, or what are ways we can fix it? Um, I guess that's maybe a two part thing, but, but it gets into really complicated, delicate steroid biology. So we're talking about things like the cyclooxygenase pathway. We're talking about different like apoptotic pathways. Like is the collagen breaking down from the follicles? Like are we going through the proper hormonal steps to allow that egg to release? Yeah, and then what about if the patient actually has ovulated? Is that something that you could actually see when you're doing the egg retrieval, if that's the reason why they have no egg? You can, you can, and that's of course a, a huge reason. And I almost, you know, even, uh, you know, that, that's rare, but it can happen, especially in women who are low responders, because sometimes they break through, especially if we're using an antagonist cycle where their own bodies, FSH and LH are really just high. That's who they are, right? They have diminished ovarian reserve. And sometimes they break through the antagonist, the Ganorelix or the Cetratide that we use. Um, so what we would see is you see fluid around the ovary or fluid in the cul-de-sac. Isn't that so funny? In like human anatomy, there's a part of the body called the cul-de-sac. I'm like, that was the end of that uh, bedroom community street. <laughs> I agree. It is funny that we call it that. So but, what kind of things um, would you do? So if someone's ovulated, what would you do next time? Yeah. So what would I do next time? So it uh, depends on the reason, of course, right? So um, if she broke through, uh, I would probably use a different protocol. Um, I would be monitoring her maybe that bit more closely. Usually I see people at the end of a cycle every other day, but maybe I would start monitoring her every day and I would be monitoring LH levels. And maybe I would give an antagonist on the morning if I was doing an antagonist cycle um, of the trigger shot. So there's some other little things that we would do. Um, but, I, but I might even use a Lupron cycle, a long Lupron cycle, um, as a way to, um, to better um, uh, prevent ovulation if that were the cause. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's kind of like you want to wear, if your pants are falling off, you want to wear a belt and suspenders. So sometimes you can just use Lupron and the antagonist, use a whole bunch of the antagonists for people who do that to you, because I've seen it before. Those are some really challenging cases. I have, you know, one other thing that sometimes as far as the trigger goes, and actually this data came from, from the UCSF um, period where they're talking about, their, their endpoint actually, to be fair, Amy, wasn't um, uh, egg yield, egg number, but I think it was egg maturity, but it, but it gets into this when you do like a co-trigger. So when you trigger not just with HCG, but you trigger with FSH. So when I trigger, I would for sure give a 10K HCG trigger. I might even do a 20K, a couple of my partners do that. Um, and then um, also give it with a good bolus of follicle stimulating hormone. Because naturally the way the human body works is it's not just an LH surge guys, it's also an LH with a little bit of FSH surge. So the idea of trying to do that, LH, AKA HCG, with a little bit of folistim or gonal F, may be a little bit of benefit. So there you go, belt and suspenders. <laughs> exactly, and I do that too. I sometimes add 300 or 600 I use of gonal F or you know, FSH based on that exact same study that you just shared with us. So it's like we're the same person. We should be in the same city. I know. Come on, move down, move to LA. Yeah, seriously. Okay. So the next challenge. I miss Berkeley though. I, you know, the, the scones and the lattes are so much better up there. Oh. Right. What year did you graduate? I forgot. Oh, geez. I don't want to date myself. Let's say early nineties. Think Pearl Jam. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, we were, we were, we're not that far. We're basically the same age. So we were, might've been there at the same time. Okay. Mm. So next is mature eggs. And you brought it up. Like what if, you do an egg retrieval and you get, let's say, a certain number of eggs, let's say five eggs, and none are mature. That's a challenge. What would you do next? Right, right, right. So a um, couple of things. Number one is, um, of course, you got to sit down. you got to go through the protocol with like a fine tooth comb. Um, and uh, what I typically do is I'll push another day. 
right? A lot of times we'll be like, okay, if I triggered you on day 10 and your follicles were in that OG perfect spot, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to go one more day the next time. And even though I historically have done well with triggering when I've got three follicles, 18 millimeters or greater, by the way, I measure in two dimensions, not just one dimension, um, then I might, for this unique patient, um, uh, trigger it a 20 or trigger it a 22 um, and, and as a way to help push egg maturity. Um, the other thing is it gets to that HCG. So I, I would definitely, um, depends on her diagnosis, because if she's like a hardcore PCO patient or a hardcore hypothalamic, remember guys, I've taken care of people who were super fit, right? Like I was an old military doctor. So, you know, people who've gone to Hawaii, like Ironman, Iron Women athletes, and, and, and fertility is not a time to be bone rail thin. You know, like we need healthy fats. And when you're super lean or hypothalamic, um, and that may be a food issue, or it may just be a biology issue. And again, um, uh, you know, we need some Pete's coffee to talk about that. But, um, but, uh, but then I would never trigger with um, uh, Lupron. I would trigger with HCG because they need that LH. Um, but but that, and that may also help push the egg maturity thing. Um, so those are some tools that I use. We also just talked about that FSH thing. Right. I agree. I do the same thing. Okay, so now you have mature eggs and no fertilization. What do you think about when you have that challenge in front of you? Right, right, right. And that's always really upsetting. That's a tough call. And, and back in the old days of IVF, um, when we didn't have ICSI, right? ICSI, has, it was, it's been around for a while. It was developed in the, in the 90s in Paris, and then the Americans really optimized the technique. But um, uh, so a so few things is um, I'd want to look at the fertilization method because um, if we're doing ICSI, remember that's when we get the best sperm, we inseminate it directly into the egg, just a single sperm. We learn about the egg. Right? We learn about the membrane of the egg. We learn, is the egg dark or granular? Are there a lot of inclusion bodies or a lot of like oxidative stress, I guess you might say? Because we're trying to get a sense, is this more of an egg issue, no fert, or is this more of a sperm issue for no fertilization? So, so sometimes ICSI helps us that way. Um, other things is sort of going back to the future, which is sort of a funny concept we've used in our laboratory at HRC Fertility in Pasadena is like an old calcium ionophore where, where we can put calcium, you know, what if it's calcium? Calcium is like a two positive ions. I know everyone's like, it's for your bones. But what it is is these like two positive ions and putting that, it changes the electrical membrane of the egg slightly. And then arguably it may help um, the sperm sort of better get in. And, um, and one of the cool things biologically, I know I'm totally, this is a tangent, Amy, I'm sorry, but what like whoever designed this as humans, it is awesome because we biologically, once the sperm hits, even naturally, right? One sperm fertilizes the egg, then there's a, whew, a huge, like electrical cascade of ions. So huge, they kick all the other sperm out from around the egg. So this idea of sort of loosening up the zona pellucida or the shell of the egg may help a little bit um, with fertilization. So anyways, those are some thoughts. Um, I'm not sure, do you have other ideas as well? Um, no, I'm right there with you. That's exactly what I would do too. See about ICSI, PICSI. There's different things you can do. If you did ICSI, PICSI, then do calcium ionophore. I, I'm right there with you. Yeah, you know, Pixie, I think Pixie regionally, I'm glad you brought this up, is a little more of a Bay Area thing. Um, because, in, and I've traveled, I, I've worked in, you know, I did my residency in New York, so I, I, I know the fertility guys there, and I did my um, fellowship in D.C., and then now I'm in Los Angeles. It's weird how, like, healthcare gets a little bit regional. And Pixie, that's where you you know, sort of grow the sperm on a membrane, on a gel, and then you sort of pick it out. And ideally you're picking the best um, sperm uh, that's going to be the super sperm that can fertilize it. But, you know, my understanding is it's, it's 
only somewhat effective. I, I, you know, I think people believe in it a little more than others. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's going to be a superhero for every case, but, you know, when, when my patients are, and <clears throat> most of my patients are over the age of 39, so we're so lucky to even get one egg, and I'm like, I got to yeah. make sure I pick that winter sperm with a little superhero cap on the back, on its back. Yeah. Okay, so then how about no sperm on the day of egg retrieval? So that's a great question. So I, I've been in this situation before. Some of it's a little more anticipated, and other times it's not. Honestly, just a personal story. I was taking care of a wonderful couple. They were immigrants from the Middle East running away from the troubles. And, you know, they, they spoke pretty darn good English, but they weren't perfect, I guess you might say. And, and the gentleman went to his primary care doctor. who was like, hey, you know, my wife's going through fertility. I'm feeling a little sluggish, a little slow. And the primary care doctor, well-meaning, was like, oh, why don't you just take a little bit of testosterone? So he was, and you know, he didn't share it with me, right? He just didn't mention it to me. And he was on testosterone for a couple of months while his wife was getting ready to go through egg retrieval. We go to sperm retrieval. Their, their semen analysis beforehand was great. And he ejaculates, no sperm, nada. Next time we're like, oh, sir, you might, maybe it was just a bad thing. We didn't anticipate it. I looked at the sperm analysis. Again, and he could ejaculate twice on the same day, the poor guy. And, uh, and he did it, and uh, no sperm again. So what do we do? We froze eggs. And, um, and thank God we live now. Then we talked to him more. We're like, hey, what's going on? And, and, and he took testosterone. So that just shut his sperm production down. So anyways, we were, it, it, there's a, a happy story at the end is that he stopped testosterone. We got him on some vitamins. I think he took some Clomid. And, and they, uh, they actually had two, two children because he ultimately reproduced sperm, which is great. Right. But um, yeah, so that, that's like the unexpected. Um, sometimes also, uh, we can also, of course, retrieve sperm. So um, I myself am trained to do basic sperm retrievals, like a PESA, a percutaneous epididymal sperm aspiration, um, or just like a testicular biopsy. Um, but in, in other situations, you really want to know, like, what's the cause for no sperm? Um, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. It is super rare to have an unexpected no sperm. Um, one thing also I've had, which is really um, nerve wracking, is when a poor, uh, uh, one of my male patients just can't produce a specimen, right? It's not that he doesn't have sperm, but he's just like, you know, the room, I mean, the room's hectic for a lot of guys, right? Um, and I know we make light of it, but you know, most men don't interact with healthcare until they, we ask them to do the most private intimate act, right? And that private intimate act is in like a medical room with, you know, dirty magazines and things or dirty videos, no magazines anymore because of the pandemic. But um, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's a situation. Sometimes we give um, what we call emergent Viagra um, as a way to maybe we can, you know, help the, the production of an erection. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, again, freeze eggs, come back on another day and, and go from there. Yeah, I call this sperm emergencies and there's no, there's no, uh, I'm trying to make a joke, ambulance that comes to help with that. I wish that there was like a yeah. kiosk where you can go and- You know, in our field, there's very few emergencies, right? Right. right. My, my emergencies are literally yesterday, I just saw a patient, um, a new young woman who knew diagnosis of breast cancer. Hey, John, can you see her? Of course, right? So we saw her within a day and really nice person. We're going to be starting meds in just a couple of days. Yeah. Um, the other is the sperm emergency. And then rarely is a ruptured ectopic, but gosh, we know about those now. R ruptured ectopics are so rare. Right. 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 Okay. Sorry. So I digress. I'm chatty. What can I no, say? No, we love it. That's why you're here. Okay. So now we talked about no sperm, but what about you have sperm, you've made embryos, but then no blastocysts. So there's no embryo progression and there's no blastocysts from the case. What would you think, what would you think about? How would you help a couple or a, a person in that situation? Yeah, I think that that's a great question and it comes up. And this is where I think when you're working with your fertility doctor, you really need to like powwow 
like afterwards and you need that 20 minute conversation, you know, with the doctor, you got to get their insight. And, and really it goes from the first time you met them. That's what I do. We go through their pre cycle testing labs. What's their AMH? What's their sperm analysis? Did you do a DNA fragmentation of the sperm? Um, you know, things like that. Um, also you go through the nitty gritty of the embryology and you try to get a sense, is this an egg issue or is this a sperm issue? I, I also want to know where did the embryos stop developing, right? Because in, in our literature, there's, there's a thing called, let's say, a day three arrest, right? Um, and and um, what's a day three arrest? So day three is you go um, from day one, where it's a fertilized egg. Day two, there's typically two cells, four cells. Day three, six, seven, eight, nine cells. And then the embryo does this crazy thing where it becomes a blob, like a morula, a compacting cell. And then it goes through this beautiful, like, I mean, remarkable um, chariots of fire sort of music in the background, embryonic expansion. And, um, and, and if, you if you stop at that day three, the old historical thought was, the egg is sort of the boss, by the way, from day one to day three. And I mean, the egg is sort of always the boss, but, but that's another thing. But, um, but, uh, but the egg is the boss because the size of the embryo is the size of the egg on day one, day two, day three, right? And you just get different cells within that egg shell, I guess you would say. And then the shell sort of morphs and it becomes a glob and expands. So when you have a day three arrest, people think historically that it's more of a sperm issue because that's when you need the sperm genome to really activate and go through this expansion process. But, but my understanding of the literature is there's a growing body of evidence is that the, the egg quality also plays a big role. So, so this idea of like the mitochondria of the egg, is it healthy, strong, fit mitochondria? Are the engines of the egg really good? That's what the mitochondria is. So, so this idea, and a lot of this came out of Boston, some, some laboratories there, and then other groups around the world have looked about this, is can we improve egg quality by improving the engines of the egg? And, and the idea is that you get a lot of day three arrest, you don't make it to blast, that was your question, where you, um, it may not just be a sperm issue, but there may be like an egg energy issue. So, there you go. That, I don't know. That's, that's some thoughts that I have. And I sort of talk to people and then everyone always comes to me. And this is the hardest thing, Amy, is, um, hey, doctor. Hey, John. Hey, Dr. Norian. Like, how can I improve egg quality? Right. I, I have this like no conversion to blast thing. What can I do? And um, it's hard. It's really hard. In, in the old days when they didn't know what the heck they were doing, Jacques Cohen, a pioneer in our field, wonderful guy. I mean, this is like in the early 80s. And they took cytoplasm from a young donor egg and they put it into an egg of an older woman. I mean, it was shut down in a heartbeat. I mean, the federal government, the FDA is like, what the hell are you doing? Three person embryos? This is like not allowed. And, and honestly, Jacques didn't know what he was doing. They didn't transfer this embryo. They were just learning. Guys, like in the 80s with IVF, we just didn't know. So what they saw, though, was really remarkable. Way to go, Dr. Cohen, right? Because what they saw is that egg quality from the cytoplasm of that young donor into that older person, really, like, it, they became good embryos. But you can't do that. And, and then we get into all this, like, CoQ10 of the world and all these, like, supplements and all these different things of trying to get that engine of the cell better, eat healthy, sleep, you know, low inflammatory diet, you know, all this stuff we talk about. I'm a huge wonk when it comes to nutrition, but, but realistically, it only takes us so far. Changing egg quality is difficult. So now we have blastocysts, but what if none of them have normal chromosomes? What do you do then? Yeah, yeah. So then it's like, what's the age of the female? How many blastocysts did you have? Is this more of like, a chance thing, right? Where we know that as women get older, the likelihood of having a chromosomally normal embryo does decline, right? So it may just be, eh, I'm human, right? Or it may be, um, you, you know, those are sort of the main things, or it may just be a numbers issue, right? Where uh, if I just had more numbers, 
then I would have had a higher chance of having a chromosomally normal embryo, right? Because even let's say in women under what I tell people when they're under 35, um, the likelihood of having a chromosomally normal blastocyst, the early studies suggested about 60 to 65% normal per embryo. I think that number is lower. I, I'd love your thoughts on that. Um, when we're using the better sequencing platforms that we're using now, I, I, I usually see it at about like 55% in that age. What do you think about that, Amy? Yeah, I mean, way? I think it's anywhere between 35 and 45%. I say 50% is probably closer to like age 30. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Yeah, so, so it depends on the age of the woman. Um, a woman who's older, right, like a woman who's over, let's say, 42, and she's got, you know, a, bla a few blastocysts, the likelihood of normal per embryo is going to be about 15, maybe 20% per embryo. So it just may be a numbers thing. And remember, it's per embryo, guys. Like even if something that's 50%, like flipping a coin, it's 50% each time. It's not 50% overall. So, um, so, so that's that. The other thing, just to highlight your question a little bit, like, hey, hey, you know, what if there's no normal chromosomes? Um, I, you know, occasionally, especially a couple who's had like recurrent miscarriages, I might even do a carrier type to just make sure there's not like a translocation. Now, like what's a translocation? I probably should comment on that. Um, so a translocation is where you have a little bit of one chromosome do a switcheroo with another chromosome, excuse my language. But, but that's where, let's say, part of the end of, let's say, chromosome one, goes on the end of chromosome four and four goes on one and one goes on four. And that person, if the break point was at the right spot, they can go live a nice, happy, productive life because they have all their genes, right? Remember genes are different than chromosomes. The problem is when they go to reproduce, if you have a translocation, it can be, it can be difficult making normal embryos or balanced, trans balanced embryos. So, so that's something. Uh, I will say with the next generation sequencing that we're doing a lot with the PGT now, sometimes you do pick up translocations. It depends how big it is, where it is, things like that. Yeah. Okay, so now we have normal blastocysts. See what I'm doing? And then you're transferring them or you want to transfer into the uterus, but the lining is just not thick enough. How do you deal with that challenge? Yeah, so... So thin linings, how do we deal with thin linings? Those are tricky and, and they affect, you know, a, a certain percentage of all of our patients. Um, so number one is you want to talk to the patient, right? That's always huge, right? Has this person had, um, uh, you know, procedures? Has she had a DNC? Did she have um, a delivery and then had an infection right after labor and had a, you know, they couldn't remove the whole placenta and she had an infection? It's like, did she have, does she have scar tissue? Is there like a mechanical cause for having a thin lining? And if there is, then maybe doing, you know, repairing the uterus might help a little bit. Um, so that's one thing. One other big thing is, is it, I, it the, the question is not just thickness, but what's the pattern? Because I'm more of a pattern person. I'm not, I'm not sure about yourself, uh, versus a thickness person. So, so typically doctors like myself, yourself, we like the lining to be greater than seven, seven and a half millimeters. You know, once you hit eight, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I think my sweet OG spot, excuse to that term again, but is uh, between nine and 13, nine and 14 millimeters. Um, uh, but, but I'm really, is it triple line? Is it pretty darn close to triple line or like a mixed pattern? Because if it's a good pattern, I've even had a surrogate. Oh my gosh, this was hectic. It was like we had just opened up this office. I was working with a new group of you know, partners and um, I had um, a, a woman who needed a surrogate and, and it ended up being her sister or friend or something like that. And the, you know, it was a whole story. Anyways, I could not get her lining thicker than six millimeters, but it was gorgeously triple line. And again, I just closed my eyes, Dr. Amy, and I looked at that pattern and I was like, I'm doing this. And it ended up being effective. But, um, but, but anyway, so, so it's not always the case. That's not always happened because then doctors like us, we try to make, we try to fix it, right? We try to thicken the lining. 
And um, what are some things that we do? Usually I use injectable cycles. I know it's a total pain and I'm sorry for that, but I just think the pharmacokinetics, like the absorption, the half-life of estrogen, progesterone is better if it's injectable. But, but sometimes using different routes of estrogen, um, people behave better with. And, uh, and, and again, we, we need that cup of Pete's coffee to talk about why, but, um, but, but part of that is, and I have no, I wish I owned Pete's by the way, that would be great, but I don't. But, um, but uh, the reason for that is the estrogen receptor DNA is highly conserved in humans. So, so we all have the same DNA for our estrogen receptor. The deal is, is that upstream, downstream of that receptor are these enhancers, silencers, transcription factors, modifiers. And that's where sometimes the different route of estrogen may help thicken that lining a little bit better. And that's why certain women are like, um, even my sister included, is like, oh my God, John, I hate orthotricycline, but I love this other one, right? Or vice versa, or like, oh, I'm totally an orthotricycline girl. Um, for whatever reason, it's not because of the estrogen, because remember the estrogen receptor, they all have like estradiol, presumably, or ethanol estradiol, but it, it's the, how they fit on the, um, on the receptor. So there you go. Awesome. That was sort of a long answer, but different routes of progest estrogen, progesterone, other things, sometimes I use pentoxyphylin, um, that also can help improve blood flow um, to the lining. Um, believe it or not, Viagra, um, which is, uh, there's some evidence there. It's not great evidence um, as a way to improve blood flow. Remember, forming an erection is a blood flow issue. It's not like this whole other thing. So it's just trying to improve blood flow to the endometrium. Yeah, I agree. And then also some vitamins like vitamin E, L-arginine, I've seen help, adding aspirin. There's a study looking at HGH, for example, and I've also used hyperbaric oxygen therapy in patients with thin linings, and I've seen that help too. Okay, so now you have a beautiful lining, but there's a little bit of fluid in the lining. What would you do then? So fluid in the lining. Um, so first steps um, are, it may not be too big a deal if it's a small amount of fluid. Um, if it's one millimeter, your doctor may write it and may tell you some like basic things um, as a way to slightly help improve blood flow to the uterus and maybe help extrude the fluid. And, and, and play along with me, Amy, it's actually something I don't love talking about even as a reproductive specialist. But so number one, I tell people, do some jumping jacks. Just get that blood flowing through your body. Yeah, move yeah. Around you do not exercise. tell them to do jumping jacks. Sorry? Like literally, you tell them to do jumping jacks? So I think improving blood flow through the body may help a little bit. There's very minimal evidence. Hey, I not? will try that next time. Hey man, that's why we have you on here to talk about these challenges. I wanna hear what you do. This is great. All right, um, necessarily. And then uh, the other idea is do you aspirate it, right? Do you um, just place a little thin little like piece of angel hair pasta, floppy little IUI catheter into the uterus and then just sort of gently remove it. Th those are some things I've seen done. Yeah. I agree. Reproductively, you know, I love working in my field. I love the biology. I love the steroids. I love this delicate interaction of these things that are at such low concentrations, right? Estradiol, it's like at picograms per milliliter, right? Some of our other, you know, I mean, it, it's crazy. And then I deal with my internal medicine doctor and these things have such control in our body, right? right? Um, but then I talk to my internal medicine doctors. They're like, oh yeah, I'm regulating glucose. It's at like, a milligram per deciliter. I'm like, ah, like, you know, like I'm the one delegated with these tiny little substances, these hormones that have such profound effect. Um, yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what if you have a patient? So we'll move on from that because that, I just, I, that's just too, too funny for me and I love it. But um, what if a woman cannot tolerate injections what would you do for a patient like that like she can't tolerate looking at needles giving herself needles how would you manage that challenge yeah yeah so so um you know i i I've, I've been in that situation i'm sure you have as well so number one in order to retrieve eggs we we use these hormones that are very small peptides 
right? So you, we just can't take FSH and LH. We can't take it orally because our stomach acids will just um, shred it apart and we, we, we just won't be able to stimulate the ovaries well. There are some other medications like Clomid or Letrozole that, you know, oral medications that we get, you know, instead of like one dominant follicle, maybe we'll get two or three. So this idea of doing these like mini, mini stims, um, uh, you know, you, you just don't do as well. You, you just don't get as many eggs. They don't fertilize as well. You don't create as many embryos, but, but that, that's something. Um, the other is going through an IVF cycle. Believe it or not, you're just doing these baby injections. Usually most people can do it. Sometimes we do, um, we have injection nurses that can help the patient. Um, if she can't do it herself or have her spouse or family member do it. Um, and, and, and those are some ways that we do it. Um, sometimes a little behavioral therapy can also help um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, and I bet there's, an, yeah, and there's this cool little thing. I don't know if you've heard of it, the Fuzzy Bee. It's this little device that can cool the skin down. It has a little gel pack and then it vibrates and then you don't even like feel the needle. It's really a great solution for some patients. Oh, that's cool. There's another one that we've used, Sinera, that's a, a topical, like, um, pain numbing medicine that, that can work. And, and when you do the injection, it just doesn't hurt as much. But okay. Yeah, go ahead. The, I was just going to say the other injections, when we're doing the frozen embryo transfer cycle, I usually do program cycles. Um, I, I've just found that I, I do better. I know there's a, a you know group of literature where you do these natural cycles and I've played around with it and have done some. And of course, read, read all the studies and and whatnot. So what I tend to do is I use non-injectables. So we use oral medications, we use vaginal medications, patches, you know, injectables tend to just be like more steady state absorption. But if you're on it, and you're not going to miss your dose at two in the afternoon, then you can maybe do the, the non-injectable ones. I agree. I feel like the vaginal suppositories are just as good as the injectable. If you skip one, though, your efforts are done. And I don't think people realize how important it is to, to keep to the schedule. And in these studies that show that the injectables are better, I don't, I don't really believe that. I think in, in a certain patient population, um, vaginal oral administration of some of this stuff is just as good. So I'm glad you said that. I'm, yeah, I'm a little bit of a wimp. I'd love to ask you, when I use my progesterone, I use it usually twofold because I take care of humans, right? And we're, we're, we're not perfect. I usually give um, vaginal pro endometrin or a vaginal progesterone suppository. And uh, usually an oral, like, because I, I want, it's the belt and suspenders thing. But I know the studies show just straight vaginal is, is what was effective in right. theory. Right. Okay, so let's say, last challenge for you. You have uh -oh. a patient, I know, and she can't take hormones. She's like so allergic or she has a blood clotting history or something that makes her so she cannot take hormones. How would you handle that IVF challenge? Okay, so not take hormones. So a lot of times I have patients who can't take birth control pills, right? Remember we use birth control to help regulate, plan, and synchronize the cycle. So those are where we do what we call a day two start. So we, we just do that. We can avoid birth control pills very easily. The other is a lot of times I talk to the patients and I tell them that I'm giving you natural hormones. I know that you go down to that, you know, gem shop and they're telling you this is, you know, natural estrogen and it's, they're putting in estradiol, estriol, and they're saying, this is natural. Your doctor is not giving you natural hormones. I'm like, baloney, I'm giving you estradiol. I'm giving what your body produced. Estriol is what you produce when you were a fetus before you came out of your mother's abdomen. But, um, you know, so, so I, I really try to like talk to my patients, make them ex understand like what we're doing. We're just helping supplement the body of its own hormones. Um, but otherwise, you know, we could do natural cycles. I'm not a huge believer in like natural IVF. So I like don't want to waste a year and a half retrieving one egg, retrieving zero eggs, retrieving one egg, retrieving zero eggs, retrieving one. You know, like that's what natural IVF is. Right. So, okay, your pregnancy rate per transfer is good, but you just wasted two years of your 41-year-old patient's life right. because you didn't do a good job communicating to her about the hormones that we use or just the body's own pituitary hormones, our own estrogen or progesterone. So, 
I don't know. I think that's sort of my approach. I try not to use synthetic hormones. Um, and um, especially if someone has a blood clot, then, um, you know, we really, really, you know, are hyper aware of that. We'll do, um, you know, a full thrombophilia panel. I'll try to really understand what's going on with their biology and, and that sort of thing. Love it. Love it. Okay, John. Well, thank you for joining us today on our show about challenges and challenging IVF cases. You did such a great job communicating with us. I know that you are known to be a fabulous communicator. So your patients are so, so lucky to have you at HRC. So thank you for joining us today. Will you come back for a live Q&A soon? I would love to. I would love, this is my maiden voyage. This is my first time on, on Dr. Amy. <laughs> I was a day, have a nice day. It's great, I love <laughs> That's it. That's great, that's me. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate you so, so much and we'll see you soon, okay? Thanks Thank again. you for having me. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 